In these boxes is the new DA3000 auto drive from Dylan. And in this video, we're gonna get hands on with it. This is gonna be a cool video. Gavin Gee here from ultimateloader.com. In these boxes, I've got Dylan's new DA3000 auto drive. Back in the storeroom, I have a brand new CP2000 case processing press in the box. I'm gonna put it all together I'm gonna show you all that's included with the DA3000, how to set it up, installing it on the CP2000, and we're gonna get ready for, we're gonna prepare for bulk conversion of 223 brass to 300 blackout brass. And in future videos, we're gonna take a look at bulk conversion and bulk loading, and I've got some full auto fun as well. But nothing's gonna happen until we get this DA3000 out of the box, so I'm gonna get going on that. Well, here's the contents of the two boxes after I got everything unpacked. Now, this is classic Dylan packing. The main components on the heavier side, the larger box, were in custom foam molded inserts and everything was securely packaged. Here's what we've got. We've got the, the main mounting bracket and motor. We've got the control box. We've got the sprocket. This is gonna mount to the press and actuate the press by means of the drive chain, which is right here. We've got a cover. We've got the main mounting pole. And again, this is maybe not correct terminology. I'm gonna go through the instruction manual in preparation for getting all this set up. Uh, we've got a number of cables and switches. We've got some mounting hardware with some standoffs. The main power cord, uh, what looks like a primer discharge hose discharge chute and funnel for brass coming off of the CP2000. We've got a really detailed owner's manual. So this goes through the setup process step by step. And I will be going literally through this instruction by instruction to get this baby set up. And then we've got the safety shield. Okay, so that's what's included with the DA3000. What I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna get the CP2000 out of the box and then I'm gonna go through the instructions and get everything set up end to end. So I just went through the entire setup of the CP2000 on the DA3000. Everything went really smooth. There's a lot of little steps, but everything is very clearly documented in this owner's manual that comes with the DA3000. And there's even specific flows for whether you're using an RL1100 or a CP2000, and if you have a machine that's already assembled or a brand new machine. So I used the instructions for a brand new CP2000. It guided me through the process step by step. And if I hit the start button here, we can see We've got indexing, I've got all my primary caliber conversion kit parts installed, and basically, I'm gonna hit the stop button here, I'm now ready to get my dies installed, the RT1500 trimmer installed, and, and all that, which I'll cover in brief later in this video. So the machine is ready to roll, it's indexing smoothly, and what I wanna do next is do a high level walkthrough of the different steps that were required to get to this point. Now I will note that Dylan has a detailed in-depth setup video with Gary and Chris that walks through every single screw, every bracket, every step. And so that's not necessary for this video, but I did wanna give you guys an idea of what the process looks like and the level of complexity. 
So the first phase of the setup is kind of the initial disassembly and crankshaft swap on the actual machine, the CP2000 in this case. So we remove the bin bracket, remove the tool head, we remove the factory crankshaft, which is the handle driven crankshaft. There's two different crankshafts for the DA3000, that's why you order separate kits. The RL1100 has one style of crankshaft with the sprocket on it. The CP2000, which I have here, has another style. They're slightly different. So just know that if you happen to be ready to order a DA3000 auto drive. And then the last part of this phase is to adjust, adjust the stop position to make sure that you're going to have the proper indexing. Next, we have mounting the DA3000 and joining the two major assemblies. So mounting the DA3000 base to the bench, it has the same hole pattern as the RL1100 and CP2000 share. What I did was I found an old mounting plate for the Ultimate Reloader bench system that had the hole pattern for the XL650 on it. Now that's a little bit different rectangular pattern. So I re-drilled holes, I put uh, stop nuts on the bottom and used quarter 20 bolts to mount the DA3000 frame to the plate. The plate now is something that I can quickly attach to my bench top via these wing nuts. And I have partial overhang here from the plate, so I drilled all the way through so that I could attach those inboard bolts to get the washers and the nuts up there. And then we go all the way through and easily tighten from the top on the front. So depending on the type of bench overhang you have, you're gonna have to just make sure that you have the right hardware and set up accordingly. This worked out really well, and since you're only occasionally manually cranking the press, uh, there's really no forces to speak of between the DA3000 and the bench. It's all self-contained between the machine and the DA3000. So, once you have your RL1100 or CP2000 attached to the DA3000 base, you can then install the drive chain. This is like a miniature bicycle chain, the entire motor assembly rotates. So you basically pull it close, put the chain in place, and then kind of let gravity do its thing, may give it, give it a little bit of a nudge, take the slack out, and then tighten the three bolts. That's about all there is to the drive chain install. And then you take a sight line look down the two sprockets and make sure that everything is aligned correctly. And then I took a moment at this point to also install the rest of my caliber conversion parts, my shell plate, uh, the tool head, now this is a special tool head. This is the low cut tool head for 300 blackout trimming. You can see there's an entire kind of scalloped portion here with three die stations. We need to get that RT1500 down lower than what would be allowed on a regular RL1100 and CP2000 tool head. So that was a great time for me to get that installed. Okay, next, accessories, the controller, sensors, and case feed. So there's this large cartridge catch funnel. This is really cool. It's this huge rectangular funnel that goes down into this giant hose and you put the end of the hose in your box or your bin, whatever it is that your processed cases or completed cartridges are going to fall into, depending on if you have a CP2000 or an RL1100. Love the industrial nature of that. The case feed mounting post is a different design. It has the, the mounting holes for the safety shield brackets and for the controller box. We have the spent primer funnel and hose over on the other side. Again, kind of like completed cartridge. This is just gonna go into a trash can and just pile up, nothing to collect into a smaller container like would be normal on a regular press. Then we have the brackets for the safety shield, this clear plastic shield here. There's two on the case feed mounting pole in the post, and then there's one on the other side. There's also a front bracket that supports it from the bottom. The entire shield is set down into place, and there's a micro switch that senses that it is in place and that it's safe to run. Normally at this point, we would install the side cover, but I wanted to leave this off for the time being so that I could show you the chains and sprockets working. I'm gonna put that in place before I do bulk loading. We've got the controller box, which is affixed to the case feed mounting pole with three screws, and then the case feed bowl itself. Now it's time to connect all of the cables to the controller box and make sure that we're ready for our initial test run. So we've got 
the home sensor cable, which is held in place with a bracket on that stop screw. We've got the safety cover switch, which is a small micro switch. We've got optional sensors for things like low primers and low powder, which I don't have yet. I am planning to get those and I'll cover that in a future video. There's a remote stop switch. I didn't connect this yet because there's a giant red stop button and that's something that I can optionally add in the future. We've got the AC power cord that goes down to, in my case, 120 volts AC wall outlet. And then the motor assembly has two different plugs that plug into the control box on the side here. Okay, now it's time for a power up and jog test. Now, each time you go to use the machine, the starting position is with the tool head all the way down. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Okay, now we're gonna reinstall the safety shield. And we can hold the yellow jog button and that's gonna operate at a really slow speed. This could be the speed that you use, the mode that you use for setting up dies, validating indexing, and just generally making sure that you're ready for the start button to be hit. Okay, so I did that and I found, okay, I had to adjust my indexing just a little bit. I jogged the machine again and validated that I was indexing just right and that I was ready for a kind of full speed preview of what I'll see when I'm doing my case conversion. Next, we're gonna take a look at the controls and the menus. So let's look at the hardware interface first. We've got three knobs, down speed, up speed, which are just rotational. And then we've got menu, which is both rotation and then you can push it inwards to click a button for the different menu options. Then we've got jog, which I already showed you. You hold the yellow button down if you're in the home position. It'll very slowly go up and down. You can set your dies and do those sorts of things. Green is for starting bulk loading or case processing. Red is for a scheduled stop. And then there's the panic button. If you push in on the panic button, it's just gonna halt the machine and you have to rotate it to reset it. Okay, so let's take a quick look at the menus, when you hit the button, it's gonna to go to the top level where you can do things like look at the counter. And so I just entered this sub menu, we're gonna rotate, we could say reset to zero. Okay, and then we can go down to our, so if we go back into counter now, we'll see that it's zero. Okay, we were on back, so we hit it again, it goes back up to the top level menu. Top delay, bottom delay, and test mode. So the menus are pretty simple and if you rotate it to the left, we can see back to main. That's all there is to it. It's a, it's a simple machine uh, to operate and to configure. And we're gonna get into more of these detailed settings uh, when we get into the specific setups. Case conversion from 223 to 300 blackout in the case of this series. And then as we're looking at other scenarios, we'll fine tune accordingly. Okay. So this is a good transition. I'm gonna take a moment now to get all my 300 blackout conversion dies and settings dialed in. And we'll take a quick look at that. In future videos, we'll go in depth and include the RL1100 for loading. This is gonna be awesome. So I have the machine set up and I've run some cases through individually. Everything seems to be working great. Let me give you the high level overview starting with station utilization. So station number one is case insertion. Station number two, we've got a dedicated decapper, decapper only die. Station number three is empty, four is empty, five has the RT1500 trimmer, six is empty, seven is the hold down die on the top and swaging on the bottom, and station number eight is the mandrel die. And in the next video where we go in depth on this trimming process, and conversion process, I'll give you a little bit more detail. The high level is the decapper die is lowered until it's gonna poke out the primer and it has plenty of decapping pin protrusion. Uh, but we, we, I didn't need to go all the way down to the shell plate on this. And then another note is 
If you need to lower a die and you can't get the lock ring on top because it's too low, you can put the lock ring on the bottom. Just make sure that you have clearance manually crank the press to make sure there's no interference there. In terms of the trimmer, the trim die goes in. The 300 blackout trim die can be used to trim 300 blackout and can be used to convert 223-556 to 300 blackout, which we're showing here. We lower the die body and progressively check with a case gauge to make sure that the shoulder is where we want it to be in terms of its height. I chose to go on the lower step of my case gauge so that I had a little bit more tolerance in the chamber and I figured I'll fire farm it in the machine gun and then the second time we load it, it'll be just a straightforward loading process. Once you get that die height set and you like where your shoulder's at and you, you know it's going to chamber in the case gauge, we then apply the lock nut. Again, I went from the bottom on this one and then screw the trimmer down. Now I took a piece of 300 blackout brass, factory brass, and lowered the trimming head, the RT1500 head, until, so basically as, as it's spinning, the cutting bar is spinning with it. And when you get down and start to touch the case mouth, it'll stop spinning, you'll spin the motor and it will stick on the case mouth. Back it off ever so slightly and then tighten the top lock ring. I then trimmed some brass to make sure that the headspace was correct and the trim length was correct. I was at minimum step on the case gauge. So I'm exactly where I wanna be with both sizing and with trimming. Okay, then I attached the dust collection uh, piece here I used a 90 here and then adapted it to my shop vac. If you ran swaging on the other side, you'd be able to use the next station over for the trimmer and probably not need to trim the bottom of this dust collection unit. I'm just experimenting here. Set up working good, but it might be good to swap swaging to the other side like I've seen in one of the other uh, Dylan videos for the CP2000. Either can be made to work. And then the hold down die, we lower the tool head to the bottom position and then crank it down until it touches the shell plate and tighten the lock ring. Uh, then the more sensitive adjustment is the swaging itself. We want to raise the rod up until the point where we get appropriate swaging. And what I did was I tested priming off the, off the CP2000 to make sure I had the right feel. If you have a go, no go gauge for primer pockets, that could be a great tool to use here as well. And this is what I love about this setup. I can throw military brass in there. I can throw a, a mix of civilian non-crimped primer pocket brass and military 556 five, with crimped primer pockets. And it's all going to go through. The swaging is more or less ignored on the civilian brass. And then we go to the mandrel. This is going to punch the neck out to the appropriate diameter and uniform accordingly. And this, again, I, I lowered until I knew I was, you know, with the expander itself, the mandrel, well below where the case mouth was going to be and locked the die down. The die body has vertical adjustment and then you can also separately adjust the actual mandrel itself up and down as well. So I hand cycled the press to confirm that things were working appropriately and then I turned the machine on, would throw a few lubed cases in, have it run through and confirm that things were going. So next, we're ready to run up under full automation and see how this is gonna work. Okay, so let's run down our pre-flight checklist. We've got our spent primer tube in the garbage can. We've got our completed case tube going down into a cardboard box down here. Our shop vac is ready to go. I've got my settings dialed in here. The up speed is sort of towards the middle. Down speed is at minimum. I took the shield off, I cranked. The, the tool head into the bottom position, that's the home position, that's where we can start from. I also sprayed some lanolin lube on some mixed military, once fired, uh, 223556 mix from uh, a once fired brass manufacturer. And I've got my speed setting here, kind of somewhere in the middle. So we're gonna turn on case feed. I haven't even run this case feeder, I was manually dropping in before. That looks good so far, that's a good sign. Okay, so next I'm gonna turn on the trimmer. 
We'll turn on the shop vac, hit start, and let's see what's gonna happen. Okay, initial testing looks good. Well, this has been fun and I'll tell you, with 300 blackout brass being expensive and sometimes a little bit difficult to find, I am super pumped about this setup. I could literally get 223556 once fired military ammo by the ton and run it through this machine, run it through the RL1100, load a whole bunch of ammo, and then take it full auto. This is the best possible scenario. And that's what you're gonna wanna see in the next video. I'm gonna go over this setup in a little bit more detail. We're gonna crank out a whole bunch of converted 300 blackout brass. We're gonna have the RL1100 sitting right over here next to it, and we're gonna do bulk loading at the same time. Unfortunately, I don't have a DA3000 for the RL1100 yet, but that's definitely on my list. Here's what I wanna ask you is, what do you think of the CP2000 and the DA3000 together? What do you think about this? 300 blackout conversion process, and what are you running for case prep and case conversion? What kind of results have you gotten? Drop a comment and we'll start a discussion. That concludes this video and that means it's time to wrap it up. I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Also, we're on Facebook, YouTube, Rumble, where we've got unrestricted content and Instagram. Make sure to follow us on all those channels. Ultimate Reloader also has a commercial solutions division serving law enforcement, the military, and the gun industry. We have some unique capabilities including a comprehensive suite of recoil testing and evaluation capabilities, trigger profiling, and more. If you're interested in custom rifles like what we build here on the channel or gunsmithing services, you're going to want to go to rifles.ultimatereloader.com and get on the wait list. If you're interested in becoming a professional gunsmith, check out the Sonoran Desert Institute. They've got a degree program, they've got a certificate program, and you can study from home. Learn more at sdi.edu. Thanks again for watching.